Sorry about that. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the April Historic Ag Reserve Properties presentation with Kenny Scholes. Kenny's a longtime Poolsville resident who enjoys exploring Ag Reserve history and serves as a board member for the Montgomery Countryside Alliance. Please remain muted during the presentation unless Kenny says otherwise, and there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end. And feel free to post your questions in the chat if you feel more comfortable doing that and we will go ahead and read them for you. So Kenny, you can start whenever you're ready. All right, great. Thanks so much, Kelly. And thanks to everybody for being here. It's good to be with you all again. Um, looks like a lot of familiar faces, which is always nice, but in case anybody is new with us or on the recording, um, Kenny Schulz, I live here in Poolsville, kind of a amateur historian, I suppose, um, mostly focused over the last few years on exploring historic homes here in throughout the Ag Reserve. Um, there's a bunch of amazing old places and, and I'll talk at the end of the presentation about an upcoming uh, histo historic home tour that we're gonna do on the 20th of May that I hope you all will, will join. Um, but tonight, we're gonna, I'm gonna take a little bit of a detour and talk about um, the metropolitan line of the b &O Railroad. And, I'll tell you up front, I am by no means uh, an expert on this topic, um, but it is the 150th anniversary of the Metropolitan Line of the B&O Railroad uh, starting service. It actually, actually, really this month in, in April of 1873, um, it, was, it was really completed. And so it, it does seem like a pretty appropriate time to, to talk about it. Uh, like I said, I didn't really know much about the Metropolitan Line prior to about two months ago when Gene actually sent me a note and said, hey, you know, it's the 150th anniversary. You should really consider maybe doing something related to the to the railroad here. And um, I thought that makes a lot of sense. I don't know anything about it, but maybe maybe I should look into it. And And I... You know, I've lived in the Ag Reserve for most of my life. I've passed under the railroad tracks in Dickerson and Boyd's and uh, Barnesville, actually in Selman, I guess, just south of Barnesville, multiple times, uh, but never really gave it much of a thought, never really kind of considered the significance of it, the history of it, um, the, the, the importance of the railroad to the Ag Reserve and to the larger county. Um, and so, you know, taking some time really over the last month, digging into it a little bit has been eye opening for me. And actually, I feel like I've, I've learned a lot. And it's, it's helped me put into context a little bit more about some of the, the old homes and some of the people that I've talked about with you all uh, many times prior. So what I wanted to do tonight was really just provide a bit of an overview um, of, you know, my understanding of, of the history of, of this metropolitan line. And I'll explain what that is in a second. Uh, talk about some of the, I like to dig into some of the maybe specific kind of interesting aspects, at least aspects that I find interesting of the line um, through the Ag Reserve. Uh, and then at the end, if, if there are questions, more than happy to, uh, to attempt to answer them. Um, and if I if I can't answer them, um, luckily there is there is a whole uh, crew of of BNO experts that I've started to become acquainted with over the last month. So I can certainly get you answers quickly if if you have um, questions that I can't figure out on my own. So I always like to start these types of talks with with kind of a so what why why should we care? I mean it's a it's a railroad. It's you know, it's maybe interesting looking, but but why why does the this metropolitan line, which is essentially the railroad line that runs from Washington D.C. right up through uh, our part of the Ag Reserve up to to Point of Rocks in Maryland? Why does that matter? Uh, what did it, what is its significance when? This line opened in the 1870s. You really have to consider just how rural the county was, especially the, the upper part of the county that we now refer to as the Ag Reserve. Um, it, it 
really changed the speed at which we could move people and goods from one location to the, to another, from farmland to markets, uh, from homes into the city. And so what happens is when this rail line opens up, it, it takes travel times and drops them significantly. So prior to the 1870s, my understanding is that a trip from Rockville to DC could take around eight hours just given the state of the roads and the relative lack of transportation. Once this railroad line came into service, that trip could be done in around 45 minutes. So it really kind of changed the possibilities for people throughout the county. In the northern part of the county, where, where I am up here in the Ag Reserve, where, where most of you are, I think, it's, um, it opened up a lot of opportunities for, for farmers. In fact, you could probably make a pretty good argument that the Ag Reserve would not exist today, or at least it certainly wouldn't look the way it looks today, if the Metropolitan Line had not come through. Because what it did was, not only did it provide, you can see the quote there from uh, Montgomery Sentinel, but provide fertilizer and some of the, the equipment and um, various aspects of farming to farmers that allowed them to increase their crop yields but it also allowed them to diversify the crops they were growing. You know, prior to the 1870s, everyone up here was primarily growing wheat and corn. And, and that was because you weren't on such a tight timetable to get that crop to the market. You could, you could take some time. So if you're gonna use the CNO canal or the roads, which took a lot of time, you had that luxury because of these crops. But when the, the railroad came through, what it allowed us to do is to move goods quicker um, in markets. So things like the perishables, essentially. So as a result, there's increasing use of and, and, and development of orchards up here because we can get crops down into the markets in D.C. faster before they perish. Um, same thing with dairy farms. They start to spring up because we can move that perishable product down into the markets in D.C. So it really changed the face of, of farming and agriculture up here in the northern part of the county. And then in the southern part of the county, kind of on the, the outskirts of, of D.C., places now that we, were, you know, we know as Kensington and Garrett Park and um, Tacoma Park, what it allowed was for uh, essentially the, the, the beginning of subdivisions um, and, and kind of some, some suburban sprawl outside of the city. Now it was actually possible to commute. You know, prior to the 1870s, this idea of a commute to work was kind of a foreign concept that didn't really exist. You, you lived where you worked. The railroads, because of the speed that you could get into the city, it allowed people to change the way they lived their lives. It allowed them to live outside of the city and, and to commute into the city to their jobs on a daily basis. Um, and so it really, really changed the shape of the the entire county, uh, both from a, a transportation standpoint, but also just from a cultural standpoint. So as I said, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on, on this, and um, I just wanted to make one book recommendation. I have my own copy here, um, but this book, The Met by Susan Soderberg, who's a, a local historian, actually had the... Um, the pleasure to talk with her earlier this week before I jumped on here to talk with you all. Uh, but she wrote this book all about the Met, the Metropolitan Branch uh, line uh, a number of years ago. And, um, it, and it's a great resource. It's a great reference. I found myself reading it from front to back multiple times over because it had so much good information um, and is, and is really well done. And so I would just say, as we go through some of this stuff, if, if, you have increased interest and you want to dig deeper into kind of the story of the metropolitan branch i would start here with with susan's book because it's it's really really well done and you can find it right on uh, amazon actually okay so let's talk big picture first so baltimore and ohio railroad so the bno railroad is um you can see this map which is from the from 1876 and those really kind of bold, dark lines are the B&O Railroad and some of the branches coming off of it. And the first line that they built came in and it was completed in the 1830s. And it was the B&O main line, which connected Baltimore out to, to Cumberland. And so as we uh, zoom in here, this, this main line is kind of this line from Baltimore 
running out west um, and eventually stretching out to, to Ohio. The metropolitan branch that we're going to talk about tonight that came later um, is this branch here that that off of the main line here at Point of Rocks and then connects down to Washington. It kind of um, kind of travels the, the, the course of the Potomac River, much like the CNO Canal, um, which was a big issue. Um, the CNO Canal had just opened in the 1830s itself, and I'm sure many of you are aware of kind of the, the battle there between the CNO Canal and its ability to ship goods down the Potomac, and, um, and the, the railroad coming along, allowing us to move goods much faster. When this metropolitan line opens up in the 1870s, it really signaled the, the start of the end for the CNO Canal because we could essentially move goods along the same path much, much faster than the canal was able to do. So there, there was interest as early as the 1850s in creating a, a branch off of the, the B&O main line. Again, that's that line that ran from, from Baltimore out to Cumberland and onwards to Ohio. There's this interest in connecting that branch down to DC um, as early as the 1850s. A number of businessmen created a, a small organization. They um, secured a, a corporate charter, which was essentially just a, a legal authorization to start exploring the land to um, scout out and do some surveys on where that railroad branch might go. And they conducted a number of surveys. You can see one, one of them, um, one of the maps made from some surveys in the early 1850s is, is here in the picture. And what's interesting about this is, so the, the railroad line is kind of that dark black line. It's kind of snaking through the center up to the top uh, right part of the screen. And you can see the survey and how it runs really, really close to Barnesville. And it's close to where the current tracks ended up. But, um, but actually, the, the tracks today run um, on this picture below Barnesville, which is to the west of Barnesville, right? So this is an example of an early survey, but that is not the final plan of where the tracks actually went. And what happened was this, you know, this company has this corporate charter, and I, I think it lasts for, um, it was good for 10 years. They, they had money issues um, to, throughout the time to actually build the railroad. And then something really significant happened in 1861, which was the Civil War starts. And at that point, there's just there's zero appetite for doing construction through here, especially because, as we've talked about before, this part of the country had plenty of, you know, troop movements and Civil War activity. So no one's, no one's too keen on starting a new construction project right in the middle of this active combat zone. Um, so, so 10 years, you know, during the Civil War, this, this company's uh, corporate charter expires. So they no longer have the right to continue survey. Um, and, and nobody really wants to do much um, uh, during the Civil War anyways. But once the, once the Civil War ends in 1865, uh, the B&O Railroad um, and, and, I, and I think there was, there was a real recognition during the Civil War at just how significant railroads could be. Um, they, you know, it was a very significant line of what we call a line of communication in the military. It's a, a line to, to move troops and personnel and materials um, really showed its value during, during the war. And so after the war, my impression is that there was just a, an increased kind of um, understanding that the railroad was probably something that need, needed to be really expanded across the country because it enabled so much greater, um, you know, speed and transportation. So the BNO takes over this charter in 1865. They start to scout out where they might want to um, create this metropolitan line. They begin constructing the line in 1866. And then on April 30th, 1873, the Metropolitan Line opens up. Um, and and I, these are, I know you can't read these articles and I just have the, um, like the first line from the left, the article on the left up top in the title here, just because I, I love the way that they wrote it. Uh, the, the line opens in April, technically it's completed. And everybody, based on looking at Sentinel articles um, from, from those weeks uh, right after it was open, 
everybody's so excited. They've been watching this construction for years and now the line is open. And so they, the public is just waiting to be able to get on these trains to check this out. And there's, there's this delay of a number of weeks. And you can see each, each weekly edition of the Sentinel, um, the, the writer is getting more and more frustrated that like, hey, the tracks are complete. What's, what's taking place? And so finally, a month after, um, after the tracks are complete and the trains actually start running and, and they're commuter trains and people are using them, um, you know, everybody's happy. But, but he starts this article by saying, well, the Metropolitan Branch is at last complete. Um, and regular passenger trains have commenced running. Okay, so when we when we kind of zoom in further on the ag reserve, we're and, and just because that's really what I like to focus on, and we look at the metropolitan line of the BNO in the ag reserve. It's really only a nine mile stretch that we're talking about, right? Kind of, you look at the map here, it, it comes into the Ag Reserve, into Montgomery County, crosses the line um, right at the Monoxy River. So if you've been to the Monoxy Aqueduct and you're standing there, you can see that big, um, it's the Monoxy Trestle Bridge. I'll show you a picture of it in a second. Um, that's essentially where the Metropolitan Line is crossing into the Agricultural Reserve, runs through Dickerson, down through Barnesville, down through Boyd's, and then exit as it continues to go further down county, it exits the, the agricultural reserve. So it's really just this nine mile segment that honestly I'm kind of interested in and spent time looking at. And you can see here, um, I know it's not a great picture, but this is the, the Hopkins Atlas from 1879. Um, and you can see kind of the, the metropolitan branch um, laid out here running. Um, up from Monocacy down through Dickerson, all the way down here to, to Boyd's at the bottom of the page. So let's talk about Dickerson. So Dickerson uh, Station, this um, is one of the, well, it's the, the westernmost station in Montgomery County. Um, it's also, I guess, the northernmost station on the Metropolitan Line in Montgomery County. The The I don't know how many of you actually have been out there to Dickerson Station. I, I'm ashamed to admit, but I took this picture on Sunday night, and that was the first time I've ever really stopped at the Dickerson train tracks. I've driven under them a billion times on my way to Frederick or wherever, but um, it's a really cool little um, train station and train stop there. But this this little train station is actually quite significant. It's It's one of the few remaining... Um, original uh, train stations uh, built in 1891. It was largely burned down in the 1980s due to vandals, but rebuilt using the initial plans. But what is really significant about this structure, it's very, very small, but it was designed by the architect um, E. Francis Baldwin. And E. Francis Baldwin was a pretty renowned architect. He was from Baltimore built a number of, of buildings through and designed a number of buildings throughout Baltimore. In fact, when I was talking to Susan Soderbergh the other day about Baldwin, she made a comment that she was talking to some architectural historians and they said that, I mean, I think they were joking, but you could walk from one end of Baltimore to the other on the roofs of just Baldwin structures, um, because that's how many structures he was responsible for um, designing in the city, which is interesting. But he really got his claim of fame for his work on train stations throughout the country and on Catholic churches, which he also built um, throughout the country and actually did a lot of development and design work on um, some of the architecture at Catholic University in, in D.C. And what's really cool is that a lot of his work at these train stations is is featured throughout this metropolitan line. And. I don't know if it was his most famous uh, work, but I think it's going to be after this year. Um, but his, the Point of Rocks station, really, really beautiful brick building built in the 1890s, um, developed or designed by Baldwin. But um, it's it's on a, the, the new stamps that just came out. So you could actually 
I don't know if they're at the Poolsville Post Office, but you could go pick up your, your stamps and the Metropolitan line is featured on those stamps right now through, through Point of Rocks, which is pretty cool. So I would assume that moving forward, this will be one of those buildings that when people talk about Baldwin's work, this will be one of the, the buildings they talk about first. So a couple of other interesting things um, about Dickerson, these are personal fascination points for me, but this home, the Hayes DeLonardo home, I, I think I've talked with you all about this in the past, but um, it's a it's, it's a brick home. It's built in the 1880s. Um, it's built by the Hayes family, and the Hayes family is is actually from Barnesville, and they were running a store up there in Barnesville. And my understanding is that Barnesville was one of the more populated areas, which I know is hard to believe because Barnesville is not very populated, but Dickerson was essentially just a crossroads when the railroad came through in the 1870s. There was, there was nothing there. There was two or three structures. And uh, Richard Poole Hayes recognized an opportunity that, hey, you know, there's this, this new train coming through. There's a new train stop in Dickerson. That's a pretty good reason to, to start a business down at, those, at, that, uh, at that station and build a home. And so he builds this home um, in the 1880s, it's said that they transported the stone and, and the brick and the timber all the way from Barnesville on a, on a horse-drawn buggy all the way down here to do it. It's a beautiful, beautiful home. It sits right next to the train tracks. And the Dillonardo family has, has owned and lived in the home since the 1950s. It's been passed down to, I think, two or three generations there. And... Um, I've, I've spoken with them and they, you know, they talk about, they don't even notice the train anymore because they've been living next to it for 70 years. Um, but they have really interesting stories of, of train wrecks and small collisions and issues, but they took me into deep into their backyard, which lines up right alongside of, of the railroad tracks there in Dickerson. And they showed me, um, I didn't get a great picture of it, kind of in the center, you can kind of see it, but there's this hill rising up here. And at the top of this hill is the train tracks. And what happened was there was kind of this little cut or valley. And in the 1870s, when they came through and, and built this part of the Metropolitan Branch, the engineers had an option. They could either build a bridge over this kind of this cut, or they could fill it with dirt underneath and just turn it into kind of a, a man-made hill that the tracks could sit on top of. And they, for whatever reason, decided to go that direction. But there was a stream running through the bottom um, of this cut. And so what they had to do was essentially build this culvert. And so there's this culvert out in the middle of the woods running under the tracks. And it's a, you can walk through it. I wouldn't, and I didn't. Um, my kids probably would. But, uh, you know, it's been it's been there since the 1870s, just kind of tucked away and it connects the farmland on the on the other side of the tracks to the bottom left here. Very close to this culvert actually is this um, this pipe that I, I you know, is described to me as a spring. I, I'm not sure if that's the case or what, but it's always been flowing. Um, and allegedly, when the men were building the railroad tracks here, this is where they would hang out. and fill up their canteens and, and eat their lunch as they were kind of um, completing this, this portion of the, uh, of the tracks um, in the Dickerson area, which is kind of cool. The other big thing, and, and this was something that I had never, ever heard about before, um, and I always love learning new things about the Ag Reserve um, that are significant, but there, you know, the, the Metropolitan Branch has had a number of significant crashes um, train train wrecks since it was um, built. One of not not the most significant, but one of the most significant crashes took place in in 1942 in Dickerson. In fact, very very close to um, where I was just showing you that picture. What happens is, uh, and I took this picture on Sunday as well. And this is if you're ever driving out to the Monocacy Aqueduct, you go over a little bridge and below you is the train tracks. And this is kind of standing on that bridge, looking down, this is going towards Dickerson. So this turn here is really significant that you see in the picture. Because what happens in 1942 is that um, a, a train bringing passengers down to DC 
on the other side of this turn towards Dickerson has some type of um, air compressor issue and it stops and it needs to be fixed. And you can imagine, you know, in the 1940s, there's, there are some signaling mechanisms to other trains, but they're relatively rudimentary. And basically what they do is when this train stops, they have a signal man with the flag and he gets off the train and runs back up here to try to signal any other trains that, um, that are coming to, to slow down because there's a train stopped ahead. They, they fix their, their air compressor problem. The signal man runs back to get onto the train. Um, it, it's supposedly very, very foggy. And they start to move, but I suppose they're moving sl very slow. And another train moving on this track towards Dickerson comes up and hits them in the rear, going around 45 miles an hour. So, it, and it was, you know, it's not, that's, that's bad. It's not great, but it was not a terrible crash at that point. But what happened was when that, when those two trains made contact, that lead train became derailed. And some of the cars slid over onto the other tracks. And they slid over onto these other tracks at the exact same time that a freight train leaving Dickerson was coming up this way towards us in the picture. And it slammed into that car, causing a really significant fire um, and, and just a complete mess of, of wreckage and flames and metal everywhere. And the problem, if you've ever been to this part of the ag reserve or the I mean this is in the middle of nowhere and you can imagine the 1940s it was even more remote um it was very 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 difficult to get rescue crews and you know firemen and police and everything else needed to to respond to this incident onto the tracks to to rescue these people and so 14 people end up um end up being killed right here right on the outskirts of Dickerson in in this train wreck um made national news cause some changes in the way that trains use signal mechanisms. Um, and, you know, just obviously a, a really terrible incident that I'm, I'm, I had never heard about. Um, I talked about it. Uh, Jack Toomey sent me a note and mentioned that he had done an article in the Minoxi Monocle about it, which was, which I read and was, was really well done, but I just, I hadn't heard about it before. So kind of an interesting uh, event in, in ag reserve history here that, that made itself uh, <laughs> aware to me just from digging into this. The other um, interesting thing here, and I, I get in trouble every time I talk about this publicly, so I'm sure I'll get an email about it, but um, I just find it so fascinating that I can't help myself. Uh, the Dickerson Quarry. So, you know, a, a space of, or a, you know, an old swimming hole of lore, I suppose, that was, we've talked about before in these talks, but so a quarry that was really two quarries, but they were opened up just outside of Dickerson um, in the, the late 1800s, early 1900s. And they were pulling stone out of these quarries um, to, to actually make curbs down in DC. And I'd always wondered, you know, what, like how did they decide where to put those quarries? Why did they put them where they put them outside of Dickerson? And then as I was doing research for the Metropolitan Line, you know, I, and I started to think about some of these decisions people were making with putting structures and homes and businesses close to the tracks. I started to think like, oh, well, maybe they were thinking, put it close to the tracks, and that way you can move the stone down on the Metropolitan Line. And then going back and looking at some maps from the 1920s, came across this one map that actually shows that there had been, um, or at least there had planned to be, I don't know if it actually existed, a, a small branch that actually came off the Metropolitan Line out into the outskirts of Dickerson, which is essentially this, it goes right to the quarry. And so my guess is that they probably use this to move stone up to the main line and then down to DC. Um, those tracks are, if they ever existed, they are long, long gone and there's not a single trace of them, um, but it kind of solves a little bit of a mystery for me of, of something I've always wondered about. As we can, um, you know, as, as mentioning earlier, crossing into the Ag Reserve, um, if, if you ever go out to the Monocacy Aqueduct, there's this Monocacy Trestle train bridge um, that you can see. And uh, it's a, the, the sitting on the Monocacy Aqueduct is a really cool vantage point to watch the trains go by. I mean, you can see from this trestle bridge, it's, it's, it's an amazing engineering feat when you consider this was built in the 1870s to, to be able to elevate trains this high. Um, over the surface of the water for, for that amount of distance. Um, 
it's also interesting just to kind of think about this is really that point where um the CNO canal and the train tracks are running right next to each other within eyesight of each other. And, and they were, as I was mentioning earlier, big, big competitors in, in the standpoint of competing to get goods into DC and, and out into Western Maryland. Um, obviously the train tracks eventually won out. Um, we don't have any boats on the, on the CNO uh, canal any longer, but we still have plenty of, of trains running up and down the metropolitan line. Um, so if you're ever out there, take a, you can stop and wait and watch the trains come across there. And then the other interesting kind of bridge type structure is the Little Monocacy Viaduct. This one is more out of the way, but if, if any of you on here have never actually gone out to see this in person, I really can't recommend it enough. It's, I think it's one of those really little hidden gems here in this part of the Ag Reserve. It's out. Um, so if, if you're in Dickerson, um, instead of going to, I'm trying to remind myself of what the name of the road is, but um, instead of going out the road that you would use to go to the, to the aqueduct, you go the other way on that road. And um, the road goes right underneath this little Monoxy viaduct. It kind of ends at a dead end after this into a bunch of driveways, but you can drive right under it. And, and the reason that I strongly recommend you go out there, and I would bring your kids to or, or grandchildren, is pictures don't do it justice for how huge this structure is. And, and um, you know, this one was completed in the early 1900s, around 1906. So I'm not, I'm not completely sure. This is something that Susan and I talked about. I'm not completely sure what the bridging mechanism was from the 1870s until 1906 when the line first came in. It was probably some type of wooden trestle bridge. Um, but you can imagine that this took a significant amount of labor and time um, to put in place and is, is very much still in use on a daily basis. But really, you should drive down there because you can drive right under and walk right underneath these um, these arches. And it's really amazing to look up at them just to see how high off the ground this is and just how um, imposing the structure is. So Barnesville, so the, the Barnesville station, the Barnesville station is really not in Barnesville. Um, the Barnesville station is actually in a little crossroads that historically has been referred to as Selman because the Selman family was the owners of that property. Um, but you can see um, in the, the early 1900s here, um, this picture of, of Barnesville Station. And this is not, if you ever stop at the, um, the Barnesville Station now for, for the Mark train, this is not the building that you would see there now. Um, the bu this, this building, I, I, my understanding is it fell into kind of disrepair in the 19, I want to say 1940s or 50s. And what they ended up doing was there was this, um, there was a pump house in Rockville that was built in the 1920s. And they actually moved that house from Rockville um, out to, to Barnesville to serve as the, the station. So that's what you see that's that's standing there now. The structure there is from the 1920s. Um, but, um, but obviously, like you can imagine, Selman now, I mean, at, at the height of the railroad actually had a bunch of storefronts, more homes in that area. Right now, it's it's really you just kind of go down that hill under the under the tracks before you go up the hill into Barnesville. Um, but during its heyday, there was there was much more of kind of a, a bustling little little village right there at, at the tracks. Um, that's that's no longer really, really the case. And then Boyd's um, another one of you know these these original Metropolitan Line stations, and and Boyd's uh, as a as kind of a village and as a train stop is interesting because it's it's described in some of the historical documents as um, uh, kind of a, a like the the furthest that most people were willing to take the train on the weekends. And so what would happen is you've got these, you know, people in, in D.C., especially wealthy individuals in D.C., and they want to get out of the city for, for the weekends. And so they would jump on the Metropolitan Branch and, and take it up to different stations. And Boyd's was, you know, really, really far out there at this point. And so what happened in Boyd's is a bunch of 
um, a bunch of summer homes sprung up, a bunch of kind of resort type places sprung up, hotels for people to stay at. Um, so it almost started as I, saying it was a resort town, I think is probably a little bit uh, too strong of a statement, but it was a place that people came to kind of hang out for the weekends and, and get out of the city. And I can't talk about Boyd's and, and the, the railroad without talking about Winterbourne. So Winterbourne, um, I've, I think I've talked about before, but this was built in the 1880s by the Totten family. Totten family was very, very wealthy. Um, there was a, a Senator Totten, and then there was um, a bunch of prominent um, business people in the DC area with the Totten name. Um, I believe Fort Totten is potentially linked to that family. But um, the Totten family in the 1880s were one of those wealthy families that decided to jump on the Metropolitan train and um, and take it out to Boyd's. And they, you know, they saw this land out here. They thought it was beautiful and it provided this nice kind of time away from the city. And they purchased a parcel of land right on the train tracks, right off the train tracks. And um, <clears throat> they built this home, Winterborn. Um, when it was built, absolutely gorgeous, beautiful home. Um, the Tottens um, had a... Yeah, so Denise is mentioning that it's being rebuilt. Yes, stand by. I'm going to show you that in one second. Um, the Tottens had a bunch of um, unfortunate accidents here. They're, they had three children. Um, all three of them um, had uh, got, I think they had polio. Uh, they had a, a grandchild that that died sliding down the banister of the stairs. Um, it... it my my impression of reading the history of the place was that initially it was quite grand. People would jump on the train to come up for these very elaborate and ornate dinner parties here at the Totten's residence. Um, but over time, this place kind of became just a, almost like a, a painful place for them. Um, the The real death knell for this home happened in the 1920s. What happened was when, and this is something I hadn't mentioned previously, but when the Metropolitan Line was first built, it was just a single track. And over time, there was a recognition that it would be way, way more efficient and useful to have a second track, so so double tracked. Um, the 1920s, they came through the Metropolitan Line and they added the second track. And as you can imagine, really, that created some challenges across the entire metropolitan branch because now what happens is you've got a bunch of buildings and stations and homes that are right up on the railroad line and when you expand it there's no there's in some places not a whole lot of room to expand so what happens here with winterborne is when they build this this second line what it does is it basically cu cuts this bridge that they were using as part of kind of their their driveway it destroys that and it essentially cuts off access to the home um, makes it much more difficult to access and at that point, um, it was, you know, passed out of the family. Um, it, it clearly over time, um, you know, it was, had a couple of owners. It, it fell into really, really bad shape here over the last 30 or 40 years. If you go on YouTube and look up this home, there's, there's you know, a drone video of a drone flying through this place. It's a very, it's a, it's a spooky looking place, right? Has a really positive, um, Current story, uh, individuals from, from Down County who I've become friends with have purchased the home and they are in the process of completely rebuilding it. Um, so this is what it looks like as of about a month ago. Um, you can see, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost a complete rebuild, but they are rebuilding it in trying to use the original plants, right? Um, so they are, um, wonderful homeowners. They had to do a whole lot of battles with <laughs> different, different people in this area to just get access to this property and to officially purchase it. It's been, it's been quite a fight. Um, but they are doing everything they can to bring it back to its, its original shape, which is, which is just really amazing. Um, and that's a good segue for me to say 
that um, I'm doing another home tour on May 20th. I'm hoping you all will join me. If this, um, oops, sorry. If this looks interesting and cool to you, it's on the tour. So the the homeowners that are you know reconstructing it, they said absolutely, they'd love to have it on the tour. They'd love people to come see it and see all the work they're doing on it. Um, that home, in addition to a couple of others that we've talked about before, so there's um, Mount Ephraim, which is um, up kind of above Dickerson, beautiful um, property from the 1860s. Solomon Simpson Plantation, which has been on the tour before, um, but um, just, just an incredible property. So there's kind of the old stone section from the 1750s and then the newer section, the, the newer section from the 1890s. We have the um, the Trundle Barn, which is on Martinsburg Road. It's a big old stone barn. It looks like it's going to fall down any minute now. Um, I want to make sure everybody sees it before it does that. No, we're working to to um, get some funding to to get that uh, secured. Lindenwood Farm. Um, for those of you who know Claire Howard, the artist who does incredible paintings, uh, that's that's her and her husband's farm. That's been on the tour before. Absolutely beautiful place. And then. First time on the tour is Darnall Place, which is um, a really just incredible property from the, the late 1700s um, that I haven't had on the tour before, but really good friends of mine now own it. And so um, it, it's going to be completely opened up and it'll be a really, really cool place to visit. So I'm going to put the tickets on sale um, on Saturday morning at 9 a.m. If you're if you follow me on Facebook or Instagram, I'll put the link to the tickets there. If you want to be included on an email that I'll send out like at 9 a.m. with the link, just um, maybe put your email in the comments here or um, or you can send me an email to, to let me know you want to be on that distro and I'll make sure that you that you get the uh, the link to those tickets right at 9 a.m. And I'm only saying that just because in prior, we're, we're going to have a lot of slots, so I don't think it'll be a problem, but in prior years, it's sold out relatively quickly. So I want to make sure that I want to make sure you all are able to attend if you would like to. Okay, with that, I will go to questions. You can also post your questions in the chat if you feel more comfortable doing it that way. Kenny, I put in the chat that um, the name of that road, I believe, is Monocacy Bottom Road that you okay. were trying to think of. I'm pretty yeah. sure I had a friend that lived out there. I'm pretty sure that's the name of it. Okay. Yeah, it might be. anybody have any questions this evening? So what part of Boyd's is um, uh, Winterborn in? Where is that? Yeah, so it is, um, <laughs> it's funny because when you actually go to the driveway, you're going to be amazed because you've driven by it a billion times, but it's way, way back. Um, if you, you know, if you know where like the train tracks kind of go over the road, right there at like there's like that intersection with the light down there uh -huh. right before you like were to go over the bridge over the man-made that big lake um yeah the corner of clopper and clarksburg road it's um there's a there's a little kind of non undescript driveway that goes back into the woods there's like a swing arm gate there and um that's how you that's how you access it you know um it, the, the thing that's interesting to remember is that that huge lake is man-made and it and it it's not even that old of a lake it's it's massive but it's not that old um and so when that home was built it didn't back up to a lake it it, it was just you know farmland behind it um but now it has a, a large lake behind it any there's a, a railroad line that runs down to the uh, power plant there in Dickerson is that is that the main the main line that runs through that part? That's that's a yeah that's a small branch off the metro line. Yep, okay. yep. Um, I know exactly what you're talking about. It. Um, I'm trying to think of where it connects in, but it's right up there around the Minoxi Aqueduct that it that it links up with with the Metropolitan Branch. But yeah, it goes down into there, and 
Um, I think for, a, I don't know how much it's used now. I know for a long time, that's what they use to get coal in and out of the plant. But. Mm -hmm, right. Any other questions? Okay, well, um, I want to thank you, Kenny, for coming again. It's always a pleasure having you with us. And um, thank you all for coming to, um, to view the presentation. So we hope you had a great time. And um, feel free to email us with any questions to info at poolsvilleseniors.com. And you can unmute and say goodbye to Kenny. Great job, Kenny. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you. Very, very so good. Much. Thanks so much, Kenny. That's a lot. Have thank a great you, night, Kenny. everyone. Night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. That's fun.